Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. I hope that guy got a huge bill from the ambulance service, the totally unnecessary ambulance service. Thank you greatly for the services that you've done, OP. But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. You don't want to wait in the ED? If you insist. I work as a security guard for one of the few hospitals in our city. Besides dealing with combative patients and visitors and doing patrols around the campus, we occasionally get asked to assist with getting people out of their vehicles and escort them by wheelchair to the emergency department, ED, or their appointment at an on-site clinic. Today, a couple of nurses came to our office asking for our help. They had received a call from a gentleman who we'll call Gerald, asking for help to get out of their car as he was in severe pain. I went out with the nurses, pushing a wheelchair and radioing my partner to come assist as it sounded like it was going to take some extra hands to help him out. It took a little bit for us to find him, but we found him thanks to him blowing his car horn for all to hear. Now, I've interacted with dramatic people before, and this guy was no different. He told us all about how he was in so much pain, how he drove himself all the way over here and couldn't move the car anymore, and how he needed to be treated. We tried to offer help, but he refused to grab our arms or hands to steady himself, relying on the car door and the wheelchair to get himself in it. Once he got himself settled, he asked me to move the vehicle to a better parking spot. After all, he had handicap stickers and he needed the space to get in when he finished his visit here, so I obliged, feeling a little bit odd about the whole situation, and moved his car to a handicap spot near the ED entrance. Gerald got checked in at the ED and we were done with the situation. At least that's what I thought. Boy, were we wrong. Not even 20 minutes later, I get told that this guy wanted to leave and wanted us to take him back to his car. Apparently, he started complaining and moaning about how the wait time was too long. Keep in mind that there were people in the waiting room who had been there for hours. The ED was very full today, and this guy couldn't stand being there for even a few minutes. I first checked with ED staff because I was worried about the fact that he himself said he couldn't drive. They told me that since they hadn't triaged him and he wanted to leave so soon, they legally couldn't hold him here even if they wanted to, which they didn't really care that much since they were already busy with treating their patients. So I went back out to the ED and asked him point blank if he was really sure he wanted to leave because I didn't want to be held responsible in case he drove and got into an accident. But he said yes, he wanted to leave right then and right now. So I reluctantly pushed out of the ED towards his car. Gerald starts saying, verbatim, when we get to my car, I'm going to call the ambulance. Me. Wait, what? Gerald, yeah, going to call an ambulance. I can't drive and I don't like everyone here except you. They're too slow here and I'm not spending all night here. Besides, calling an ambulance will get me to a room quicker and I can get help with my pain. Me. So you want to call an ambulance to take you to the ED when you're already here at an ED? And all that because the wait time's too long for you? Gerald. Yeah. Me. You realize that if you call an ambulance, they may just take you back to the waiting area and you'll have to wait there, right? Gerald. Yeah, I know that. I'm still going to call. Me. Well, okay, if that's what you want to do. So after helping the guy into his car, I decided to let him do just that. At that point, there was nothing else I could really do. After all, I'm just a security guard, not his doctor. So I just pushed the wheelchair back inside and went about my business. About 30 minutes later, I'm looking at CCTV footage and right there next to this guy's car is an ambulance. My jaw dropped. The guy actually called 911 for an ambulance and they came. I continued to watch as the AMT workers helped this guy into a gurney and place him into the ambulance. Then, to my utter shock, they drove off campus. I thought that they were going to drop him off here, but they freaking left for another hospital? I then realized a couple of things. One, this guy's going to another hospital and going to be gone for who knows how long. Two, when he gets discharged, he's not going to have a ride because, you guessed it, his car is over here at this hospital. Plus, our policy is that if a car is parked in our lot for a few days and we've confirmed that the owner's not here, we have to call the police and report an abandoned vehicle. So this guy's now getting additional costs added to his medical expenses 
because he took the ambulance, possibly have to wait even more in the ED of another hospital before being seen, and may rack up some fines for abandoning his car, depending on how long he's there. All because he didn't want to wait in the ED with everyone else. But hey, guess 20 minutes was way too much for him. And our second story. It's not a taxi, but I'll take the cake. This happened in the early 2000s, 02 or 03. A small background is needed. At that point in my life, I'm a third year nurse student in the capital. I'm sharing my apartment with a good friend and he's sharing his car. The alleged car was the major factor of the story. It was a brand cherished by taxi drivers and also yellow, the color of taxis in the capital. The major differences from a taxi were the lack of the taxi sign and that it was a hatchback, taxis or sedans. It was common for someone to flag us down thinking it was a taxi until we came closer. Anyway, it was summer and my friend was island hopping with his fiance and had left the car behind. I'd woken up to an almost empty fridge and since I was paid the day before, I decided to forego the small convenience store in my neighborhood and drive to the big supermarket. I jumped in the car and took a major road artery to the store. I'm stopped in front of a bus stop waiting for the light to turn green when the back door opens and closes and I hear a woman's voice saying the name of a hospital. I turn around to say it's not a taxi, but I stopped in my tracks. A sweet old lady had entered the car. She was around 65 to 70. She's clutching her purse so hard her knuckles turning white. She's clearly panicked. She keeps mumbling, please hurry. She went into labor, please hurry. I put the car into gear and start driving towards the hospital. Nurse training kicks in and I start to talk to her to calm her down. She starts to calm and I get the whole story. Her granddaughter, 19 at the time, was pregnant and had a rough pregnancy. An hour ago went into premature labor and the grandma was panicking. We reach the hospital 20 minutes later. The guard at the entrance knows me because of hospital rotation. I drive up to the entrance and drop her. As she's trying to pay me, I tell her it's on the house. At that point, she realized it wasn't a taxi and got a bit embarrassed and tried to give me money again. I advised that if everything went well, send me a cake. Little did I know. Two weeks later, my roommate's back and receives a call from the police. They wanted to find out if he was the owner of the car and if he could go to the station. My roommate asked me if anything had happened with the car while he was gone. I said no. Having almost forgotten the incident, I decided to tag along to go to the station. We're met by an officer who guides us to an office. Inside is the sweet old lady with the box. She jumps up shouting, that's him, and hugs me. The officer is smiling. He's the father of the granddaughter and now proud grandfather. Apparently the lady told him about the incident and how helpful I was. He used his status as a police officer to get the plate from the CCTV and find the owner and thank me. The baby girl would have to spend some time in the hospital due to being almost two months early, but otherwise all right. So I got the cake. On a final note, I met the girl by coincidence a couple of years ago. She's turned out fine, and I'm studying to be a nurse. And our last story. HOA Survivor. My two cents. I've owned a unit in an HOA for seven years, and about the first four years were a complete nightmare. No fiscal oversight, constant assessments, no maintenance, pool closed in the summer because of neglected repairs, abusive letters to residents, refused to use email to communicate, wasteful contractors, frivolous lawsuits against a sister community resulting in exorbitant legal fees, you name it. The board literally had to have police attend one of the open board meetings because they knew resident backlash would be so severe and infuriatingly had the community attorney answer any questions from residents rather than have the board respond to us themselves. I was pulling my hair out and couldn't wait for the market to stabilize so I could sell my unit and GTFO. Finally, after the third assessment in a single year, after years of increasing common charges, you know what I did instead? I ran for the board. I was elected. Fortunately, two other reform-minded candidates were elected at the same time. Within two months of our questioning, researching, attending weekly, yes, weekly from 7 to 10 p.m. meetings, two of the most miserable miscreants resigned because it was obvious they wouldn't have their way anymore, and while they could intimidate the existing board members, we weren't having it. We replaced them with two more like-minded appointees and for the most part had a new board. 
I stayed on for two plus years until I purchased a home many towns away and kept that unit as a rental property. However, the community has 10 times the amount, not an exaggeration, in reserves than in the worst of the dark time years. The place looks impeccable. No small feat considering it's 45 years old. Common charges haven't been raised since the year our new board was elected, and not a single assessment since then either. I didn't think I had any time to deal with what was involved, and honestly, it was really, really hard some weeks to show up considering I had a full-time job an hour away, plus an at-home side job where every minute spent at a board meeting was time spent not making side money. I was also 26 at the time, with a boyfriend, friends, work engagements, and regular responsibilities of being a functioning adult. It sucked, but I looked at it like this was one of the biggest investments I was ever going to make in my life, and for my own sanity, I needed to secure the viability of my own home in this community. And it did pay off, because now I can collect my rent check every month from many towns over and not cringe every time I get a letter from the HOA in the mail. As much as it was a thankless, unpaid, time-consuming, pulling my hair out in frustration, PITA, I could honestly say that if this place started to go down the crapper again, I don't see how I could sit by and not run for the board again. There's satisfaction that comes with taking matters into your own hands. I truly suggest that everyone with a nightmare HOA story at least consider it. The biggest F you is when these people who made your life miserable for years realize you have a seat at the table just like they do, and this time they can't shut you down with a snarky letter. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.